He said, in life, you're going to pay one of two prices, the price of discipline or the price of regret. The price of discipline weighs ounces, right? To be fit, going to the gym, there's a price you're going to pay. It hurt your body. But the price of regret weighs tons and will crush you. Brad Pedersen, how's it going, man? It's going good, man. Dude, I'm so excited to have you. Um, for those that don't know Brad, he is one of my best buds. He's my um, adventurer, co-partner, all things crazy, all things uh, risk-taking, um, snow biking, snowboarding, mountain biking, wake surfing, I mean, and we're still discovering new sports. Kiteboarding. Kite, oh shoot, I almost forgot about that. Kiteboarding. Um, and I am lucky and privileged to uh, be involved uh, in Pila, your current company that you co-founded. I sit on the board, which is kind of bananas considering that, you know, Jay-Z was an investor and we've got Larry on the board that kind of represents uh, his capital. Um, and dude, you're just somebody that uh, I turn to often for advice, a uh, handful of people. And I've told you this in private. Uh, so people need to pay attention to what Brad's going to share, but Brad, you know, you've got a pretty cool story. If we took a few minutes, kind of go back and kind of share from your perspective, that journey. And I know it was over kind of a 20 plus year period. Um, what did that look like? So, Without going into all the gory details, because I think we went or through you this. you could. <laughs> well, we might tease some of that stuff out. You but should, yeah. First of all, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered by your affirmations. And yeah, I consider you one of my closest friends and really enjoy all the adventures we've had together and uh, really looking forward to many more. Uh, as you know, one of my mottos in life is 3M, make more magic memories and increase them in frequency and intensity. And I would say that in the last uh, 30 days, we've had many. Oh, yeah, we're bringing it up many mountaintop experiences. And I think your logo is actually a good epitomization of that, right? Like striving for the top of the mountain. So yeah, just a quick background. I mean, I grew up in a, a great home uh, with great core values, uh, really salt of the earth people in the prairies of Alberta. Um, and I was sort of predestined that I was going to go down this path of being a chiropractor. Um, this was what I was supposed to do because my father's a chiropractor, his father and mother were chiropractors, and my great-grandfather was actually the first chiropractor in Denmark. So ever since I was just a toddler, people would tell me, oh, you're going to grow up and be a chiropractor like your dad and your grandpa one day. And uh, I just assumed that's what I was going to do. Um, but as luck would have it, I decided to sort of pursue some of my passions. And uh, and that led me on a path of just saying yes to a bunch of things that for a period of time turned me into a carny um, and uh, chasing entrepreneurial pursuits that ultimately led me to the toy business. And, uh, you know, starting a, a toy company coming from the prairies is like starting a fishery if you lived in Saskatchewan. It doesn't make a lot of sense because there's really not the right resources or, or things in place there. But uh, that journey took me to Toronto where I spent close to 20 years. Um, and uh, I was the real Santa Claus, man. I, uh, I'm a toy maker from the north and uh, built things that put smiles on kids' faces. And uh, we've shipped billions of pieces of plastic around the planet. Um, it sounds like it was really awesome and aspirational. I would say it was. But that journey also had a lot of challenges in the way, um, including going bankrupt twice, including, you know, some really near-death experiences, uh, some incredible tragedy in terms of uh, members of my team. Um, but all of that for a purpose of putting me where I am today, which is really feeling empowered to be a founder of a, a startup that is making a difference. And, uh, we can, we can talk more about that, uh, as this interview goes on. Yeah. I mean, when you say the real life Santa Claus, I was on the receiving end cause I, we, we connected previous to this moment, but the Air Canada lounge, random chance encounter kind of to really connect and chat. And uh, you asked me if I had kids, I did. And mm -hmm. you said, give me your address, I'll send you a gift. Right. I did not expect a box full of Paw Patrol. So many toys that literally my wife and I, when we opened it, we, we had to hide 90% of the toys because it was more than we would give to our kids on a Christmas day. So um, that was really cool, man. I always appreciated that. And you know, you, you kind of quickly talked over the, um, the two bankruptcies. I know when we've chatted privately, you know, I'll be honest, man, I would have gave up. Hmm. Like I, you know, you read the Nike story, Phil Knight's book, and just the amount of crazy situation after crazy situation that happened to him. 
and he, and he persevered. And I, and I've, I've always felt that in your, your story. Talk about those moments where, you know, the two bankruptcies, what, what caused you to keep going versus just giving up and starting from scratch? Cause you didn't, you didn't leave your investors high and dry and you ended up building a nine figure company. And, you know, it, I mean, it's just a crazy story. What, what belief did you have during that moment that kept you pushing forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would tell you that, um, first of all, let's just wind back in terms of how I got there. You know, when I started the company and I started my business, we were on an incredible tear. And it started off with, when I said it was a carny, we literally had kiosks and malls. And that just snowballed from kiosks and malls. Well, actually it was at fairs to kiosks and malls to eventually a distribution company. And that distribution company ended up becoming the largest distribution company in Canada. We, we just continued to grow. And there was this period of time where really we had the Midas touch. Like everything we touched turned to gold. We just kept growing the business and felt like we could not, you know, not do any wrong. We were really unstoppable. And you know, what added to that, of course, was the accolades from the marketplace. We were winning awards. We were on the Profit 100 list, which oh. at that time, you know, was what it was called. I think it's now called the Growth 500. Um, and the thing I came to understand is a little bit of ego can create unnecessary overhead. And I found out the hard way that you can actually grow too fast, too quickly. And if you don't have the right capital structure, which to this day, that PTSD of that has got me constantly aware. I hear you on the board meetings. <laughs> it's always coming up and yeah. it's great. Yeah, that, that we constantly have to reinvent our capital structure. So, um, you know, when we hit that wall in 2006, where literally it was a surprise, like, and it's on me that it was a surprise, right? I should have been inspecting what I was expecting for the outcomes of the business. I wasn't doing that properly. I showed up from a vacation shortly after Christmas and within 90 days we were in special loans. And I was just like, Oh God, why? And me? this is after coming off record. recognition, like profit list. Yeah. Record Nine, year. Yeah. 90 days later. 90 days later. You don't yeah. want to be in the special loans department. <laughs> just everybody. <laughs> Hopefully you never have to experience this, but there is a special department inside the banks that deal with these kind of situation. How does that feel? You know, looking back on it now, it has less effect, you know, because at that time we're, we're, we're afraid of what we don't understand. Like, you know, it's outside of our comfort zone. I think every entrepreneur who starts a company, the one thing that they fear more than anything else is the failure in terms of the final failure being bankruptcy, right? Like there's a difference between failing and being a failure. Failing is a part of succeeding. You have to make mistakes and fail your way forward. But you're a failure when it comes to an end. Like you can't get up anymore. And literally, you know, I was sitting at the precipice with this company after growing it, after, you know, bringing in seven figures of friends and family money, uh, accolades, awards, and everything. And my entire identity was wrapped up in that company. And suddenly it was about to be lost. And I remember at the time I felt very lost. I felt like there was no future. And how was I going to overcome this, this, this challenge? And, you know, looking back now, I recognize that if money can solve your problem, it really isn't a problem. Mm. I mean, it was a problem to me at the time, but I still had my family, I had my health. And quite frankly, those two things are what allowed me to get through the next period of years that were very, very uh, tumultuous. And, um, you know, my wife who, if you've met her, which Dan has, I married way up. Um, she's an incredible woman who stood by my side through thick and thin. I'm pretty sure that when she said for better or worse, she could have said, but not for this crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, cause she went through a lot. I mean, when the lawyers show up at your door and serve you and let you know that they're going to be taking possession of the house, that's a really bad day. Um, and you're not even home. That's right. You're on the road home. doing your thing. That's right. Yeah. And she calls you. And, and, and there was this other incident. I remember she was just telling us uh, the other day about when she was driving a car and you forgot to get the insurance and she gets pulled over and she asked, I mean, there's been some moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's, that's an, you know, there have been some moments for sure. Um, but that's what makes the adventure amazing is that you go through those moments, but yeah, the, to unpack that story a little bit, my wife, uh, I was on a business trip in California. Um, we were bootstrapping the company. Uh, I was in my mid twenties and we decided to have kids at a fairly young age. I was 23 when I had my son and, uh, 25 when I had my daughter. So, uh, by most, most people's standards, that's pretty young. So I, I don't recommend the life plan of bootstrapping a company and having young kids at the same time. It is extremely challenging. And um, I couldn't afford insurance. Because on top of that, when you're a young person, the insurance on vehicles is pretty expensive. 
Um, and so I was supposed to look after the insurance bill and, um, I didn't have the money to do it. I went away on this trip and while I was away, she got pulled over and this was in Calgary in the wintertime and she's got an infant in her car and the police officer gets the vehicle towed and literally leaves her no. on the side of the road with my son. Calgary winter. <laughs> Calgary winter. Um, you can only imagine my thoughts in terms of what I would have done if that police officer had come within my, my sight. But uh, needless to say, again, that was on me. I should have taken the necessary steps to be able to look after my family and the resources. And quite frankly, the fact that my wife stood by me through that, plus all the other uh, adversities that would come, is really just a, an incredible testament to who she is as a human. And She's an incredible person. You know, Brad, one thing you said a second ago was that um, you need to inspect what you expect. And that's mm. like something I, I love about you. You know, you've always got these kind of one-liners, and I know it's been this like, you know, years of investing yourself and ferociously learning. When did that all start? Like that journey of, let's call it personal development and kind of retooling your belief systems. Cause I'm, I'm assuming if I was talking with the 19 year old Brad today, that conversation will look quite different than the, the Brad of, of today. What, where did that come from? Yeah. You know what? I, I would have to, to say that one of my greatest influences and mentors has been my father. Um, What's your dad's name? Don. Don. Yeah. He's an amazing What's guy. What's he like? He's, I haven't had the pleasure uh, yet. You haven't had the pleasure, you will. Um, you know, he's a larger than life human. When he walks into the room, you notice. Um, he's, he's just very stately. He's tall. He's very wise. Uh, when he speaks, he speaks with compassion, but authority. I had somebody, one of my cousins recently say he was always firm, fair, but fun. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that is a perfect description of him because he really was all three of those things. Mm. And, you know, he was always um, looking to be better, striving for betterment. And at an early age, I watched him read a lot of books, listen to, at that time, you know, cassette tapes, because of course that was how we got uh, content information. And, uh, and then he got involved in network marketing. And it was actually through network marketing that I decided to kind of start one of my entrepreneurial paths. And the minute I got uh, exposed to that, it was immediately a series of tapes, books, seminars, and embetterment. And I, uh, I can still remember one of the very first books I read uh, was Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc. And since watching the, the movie Founder, I maybe don't feel the same way about him. But at the time, I thought this guy was such a stud you know, in terms of what he did to take an idea that- McDonald's. Yeah, McDonald's, sorry. McDonald's is, is he's, the, he's not the original founder of the restaurant, but he's the guy who learned how to scale it, right? And there's a difference between being a founder and a scaler, right? Those yeah. are two different capacities. So, um, but he talked about, um, you know, the, 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 he said in life, you're gonna pay one of two prices, the price of discipline or the price of regret. Mm -hmm. The price of discipline weighs ounces, right? to be fit, going to the gym, there's a price you're gonna pay, it hurt your body. But the price of regret weighs tons and will crush you. And when I read that, it seared my conscience. And I literally, with a marker, wrote that out and put it into a frame next to my bedstand. And every morning I woke up, I, I read that. And it was literally my motivator to get out of bed early to do the things I didn't wanna do because I understood that they were gonna be the necessary steps, the compound effect of doing these small things over time eventually add up into a meaningful uh, outcome. And uh, you know, my father was the inspiration behind that. He's the one that started that journey for me. He's the one that pursued network marketing and embetterment that got me involved in that. And as soon as I saw that, I instantly got hooked into the idea that for me to become who I really needed to become in the future, I had to grow myself first, right? There, you can't get ahead of your own growth. You have to put the, 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 the nutrients and the water and the sunshine into that fertile soil to grow something meaningful. And um, for me, it was just, uh, it's always been, and I continue to be a lifelong learner. That, that mindset of, you know, feeding yourself the right things. You, you mentioned an analogy recently, we were hanging out around the, uh, the bowl of water would you mind mm -hmm. sharing that? Because I just thought it was just such a clear example of, you know, how we need to think of our minds. Yeah, no, this is great. And I actually got this from my uh, my mentor, uh, Darren Hardy, who uh, who I highly recommend as well. I think he's just very clear in terms of how you understand human performance. But, you know, I held up a, a glass and I have a glass here. So he said, you know, your mind is like this glass and it is non-judgmental. It'll hold whatever you put into it. 
So if you put arsenic in there, it'll hold arsenic. If you put clean water in there, it'll hold clean water. And we're no different. And uh, he then takes the glass and he pours dirty water into the glass. And he says, every day that you expose yourself to media feeds, to the news, to whatever it is that's in the outside world. You're gossip. F- you're gossip. You're just filling up every single day with dirty water because the world tends to go that way, right? I mean, the media knows that for in order to get you to watch, they got to put salacious gossip on the news. They got to tell human you. Human biology, psychology, that's right. what we respond to. The reptilian brain, right? It's like fear, flight, and fe- that's what we're thinking about. So if you pour dirty water into this, which is what we're getting every single day just by living, the only way to clean it out is by continuing to pour clean water in. And literally, if, if you do this experiment at home, put dirty water in your glass, then take a vase and put clean water and start pouring into your, your glass, you'll see that eventually the glass just starts to flush itself. And so this is just a great analogy in terms of what we should be thinking about every single day, that starting our days with gratitude, that mindset of what do I have them grateful for? I'm grateful I have both my arms, my legs, that I live in the best country on the planet, that I have freedom, I have security, I have food. There's just so much that we just take for granted. And if you travel around the world, you realize that it's not something that everybody has as a luxury. And then from there, what do I need to read? What do I need to consume that's going to help inspire me to become the best version of myself? How do I continue to expand my possibilities? You know, one of my favorite people is Jim Rohn. And he has this this saying that I just love. He says, you know, you may not be able to do all you find out, but make sure you find out all you can do. And Mm -hmm. that literally sticks with me because I know that when I'm laying on my deathbed, I want to be able to recite that I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I kept the faith, and I made the most of every moment, and that there was nothing. I left it all behind on the field of life. Played full out. Played full out. You know what I love about that analogy, Brad, is that, um, you know, it takes a second to pollute the water. But if you're pouring water in to cleanse it, it takes it takes a while, right? So it's it's this beautiful uh, visual to say like you got to be careful because it could be like reading, going down this rabbit hole of reading the news or engaging in a gossip conversation or you know allowing stuff to happen in your business that could take like this clear water and pollute it so quickly and to and to cleanse it, it takes time, it takes practice, and it may not show up right away. And I think that's actually how it works. Um, you mentioned Darren, you mentioned the, the compound effect. Who are some other people that uh, have had an uh, impact in your life, you know, along your journey in regards to mentors, coaches, et cetera? You know, I, I'm a big believer in different people in different seasons. And um, I get asked this a lot, who are your mentors? And I would say most of my mentors I've never met. Most of those people are people I've read their, uh, I've been able to get into their minds by reading their books or listening to their 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 podcast or uh, you know, being immersed in their, their worldviews and, and ideologies. Um, and I think it's, it's also prescriptive. I think that it's awareness of what it is you're looking for at this season in your life. Like, what is it you need? You know, no different than if you felt you needed, uh, you were lacking, you know, vitamin D, you'd go get some sunshine. Or if you felt like maybe you were getting sick, you'd have vitamin C. There's, there's awareness to what are the things I need to do to supplement myself. But certainly, you know, some of my favorite thought leaders have been people like um, Dale Carnegie, historically. He's been a guy that I think, you know, he got it right a long time ago. And to this day, I still read and reread How to Win Friends and Influence People because I think that's just, it's the mainstay of how do we interact with people. Um, You know, all the heroes of antiquity from the Bible, I mean, you know, Obviously, Jesus, without uh, giving him credit for ultimately who I feel I've got my faith and my future in, but just the life he modeled beyond any of the religious stuff. In fact, he was against the religious stuff. His whole story is about anti-religion, and that's a whole other story to unpack. Um, and, you know, I would say in terms of business, I've really appreciated Patrick Lencioni, John Maxwell, um, you know, Jim Collins, man, he's probably one of my favorites of all time. I'm just going through the, the top five or six that I really have leaned into. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate as well that I've had some real life mentors, that I've had people in my life who've stepped in at certain times to help me with my financial literacy or my business acumen, um, you know, stepping in a role of a chairman. Well, that was a new, you know, skin to try on. I hadn't tried that on before. So who do I need to talk to that could help me with my chairmanship? So Tom Kennedy, who's somebody you and I both know, has been somebody who's been really um instrumental in that. And, and I'd say even you, Dan, like, you know, I look at you and I look at the way that you live life large, you walk into a room 
the room lights up, the energy that you exude, the way that you just love and have a compassion for, for people in life. It's, it's a huge, huge inspiration to me. Thanks, man. You're going to make me cry, dude. I appreciate that. Um, you've got, I mean, and this is back to the saying that you live by that we repeat to ourselves frequently, uh, around, you know, creating more magical memories and increasing with intensity and frequency. Where did that come from? Cause that seems to be our first principles approach to our days, <laughs> which is going to get me in trouble with my wife if we keep it up. Cause it's, it's a lot of fun, but, um, I mean, everything from the way you create events to host people at your house to, um, you know, huck it off cliffs in the back country, where, like, <laughs> you know, jumping off the wharf after we went downhill mountain biking, it was like, we could not go cause it's going to take an hour or we could do it cause it's going to create this magical moment. Where did that, when did that start? You know, I, I, that's a great question. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to just see how high I could go. I think it started climbing trees <laughs> and you know, the funny part about that is until when we lived in uh, Ontario and Toronto, before I moved here, uh, there was a big tree in front of my house. And every year I was the only tree that was lit up right to the very top. And it's because I climbed it to hang up all the lights right to the very top. And I remember I used to always say, wow, your tree looks amazing. And I just think it's a metaphor that I just wanted to see how high I could go in everything and anything I do in life, whether it's business whether it's adventure, whether it's relationship with your wife. Um, you know, I think you said you're getting in trouble with your wife. Well, actually, making more magic memories is a principle to all of life, not just into the outdoor adventures, which we share a lot. It's about how do we do it in every area of our life. And um, I don't remember who said it, but this really uh, has continued to be um, a great metaphor that I think about often. And it's the idea that in life we're juggling rubber balls and crystal balls, right? And we're constantly like, it's hard to have awareness of what is balance, but it's easier to be aware of when you're in balance, right? It's like when you're driving down the road, you constantly are making small corrections to keep yourself going straight. And it's just awareness. You got to constantly be doing that. No different. You have to have awareness in your life of when you're out of balance and when you need to apply more effort in certain areas. And there are certain balls that we're juggling, but some of them are crystal and some of them are rubber, meaning that you drop the crystal ones, they shatter. You drop the rubber ones, they bounce. So what are the crystal balls? Your family, your faith, your fitness, and your finances. Those four, they're crystal. You can't afford to drop those ones. You've got to constantly keep moving those around. What are the rubber ones? Fun, friends, freedom, which is pursuing outdoors and those kinds of pursuits. And then what I call finishing, which is putting the final touches on you, continuing to be the best and brightest version of yourself. Those are the ones you could drop once in a while. They'll bounce. You can pick them up later, right? You can't, you don't necessarily have to have, you could have a period of time where you had not a lot of fun because you were focused on really getting a, an important project off the ground. But it's all coming down to that we're juggling and constantly aware of when we need to have balance. But in all those areas in our life, I subscribe to, I want to make them the most magical, the most memorable. And again, kind of that point of getting to the end of my life where I said, I left it all behind, soak up all the good things and squeeze it, drive every opportunity that it had to offer me. Just going full out, full out. It's really cool, Brad. Um, you know, obviously as I think people are picking up, you've got a lot of these, um, principles and sayings that are kind of like these guiding, um, ideas that, that drive your decision-making. Um, you know, obviously you had the, the blessing of having children younger so you can, you know, go through your entrepreneurial journey and then kind of have them just like you were exposed to it, um, be around it, you know, talk about today. Like I know for me having young kids and a lot of listeners are probably uh, dealing with the same, the same thing. How did you raise your kids? Cause they're incredible. You've, your, your daughter and your son are amazing people. How did you raise such well? I mean, that's the only way I can say it. Well-adjusted, not entitled, you know, but you know, but even though they, they came around or they were raised around somebody like you, like, what did you, what do you feel were some of the guiding principles for, for, from a parenting point of view? as an entrepreneur? Well, first of all, we've made lots of mistakes. 
we've made every mistake. And so I think every parent should just acknowledge that there was no manual that came with your kids that, Hey, this is how you do it. It's a part of a learn as you go. And yes, there is some wisdom from the people who've gone before you that you can learn some things, but it is a, every kid's different, every situation's different. And so it is a adaptation to the environment and what you've been presented with. Um, I've got incredible kids for sure. Um, but we've been through some incredible challenges together. And on that note, you know, I, I actually really firmly believe like we today live in a society of helicopter parents who really are trying to protect our kids from adversity and challenges. And we don't realize that we're hurting them in the process. Um, if you've heard the story of, of the caterpillar, you know, when a caterpillar is emerging from the cocoon as a butterfly, there's this incredible struggle that happens. And it's actually through that struggle that the fluid moves into its wings that allows it to fly. If you were to actually take a knife and clip the cocoon before it actually came out. Thinking it's stuck. Thinking you're helping it. Yeah. You actually would kill it because the fluid wouldn't have actually gone to the wings. And I just think that's such a brilliant metaphor for our kids and what they need to uh, face in terms of adversity. So, you know, um, Eric Gretens, one of my favorite authors, um, wrote a book called Resilience. And in that book... There's this incredible uh, quote that he talks about, you know, as human beings, there's a few things we need to live a life of optimus. We know we need food, we need sleep, we need water, we need love, we need sex, we need relationship. All these things are a part of our human uh, fulfillment plan. He said, beyond that, I'd add struggle. In order to be fully human, we need to go through struggles. Just like that butterfly, we need, have to- We need it. We need it. It's a part of who we become. You know, gold is refined in fire. You know, a diamond is a lump of coal under a lot of heat and pressure. So that doesn't mean you should be go seeking it for your kids, but certainly it's about letting them learn and Allow grow. it to happen. A hundred percent. Don't protect them. And so Kelly and I have really, I would say we are, uh, we certainly are a backstop from them ever hitting, you know, ground bottom, you know, the, the rock bottom, rock bottom. Thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, we want to let them learn through the adversities that they're facing, just like we did. Like it's what, it made us who we are. hundred percent. So if we want to help them, we really need to let them go through that. And then I think Maya Angelou said it the best. She said, you know, people will, they'll forget what you say and they do, but they'll never forget the way you make them feel. And your kids are watching. And we think as parenting is talking. And actually it's not. It's about how you make them feel and modeling out for them. And I showed you, recently, uh, my daughter, super proud. Talk of about that, man. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> well, you know, my, my kids, they, they grew up around a dad who was committed to personal development. And so my vehicles were always like a rolling university. I didn't have downtime. Like the radio didn't play in my vehicle. The thing that we were listening to all the time were audiobooks, uh, cassettes at the time, CDs when they came out and now it'd be podcasts. You'd still find that in my vehicles. And, um, you know, uh, it was just a part of who I was. And I, I thought, you know, I need to get my kids to listen to some of this stuff. And once in a while, like, I'm, I'm sure you've done it. Like you listen to somebody, like, oh, I got to get Renee to hear this, or I got to get this person to hear this. And what I've learned is that, you know, it is not about actually, you know, you lead the horse to water, but the horse has to be willing to drink. It has to be thirsty. And, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So my daughter for years heard this. It was kind of like, ah, this is dad's stuff. You know, it doesn't apply to me. It's business, it's whatever. Um, and a year ago, she decided to become an entrepreneur. Suddenly she had a need. You know, here was this, this moment in life and I'm, I'm super proud. Both of my kids, they both have got these career paths that they're taking and both of them have actually reached out to me since saying, hey, I want to learn. I want to become the person I need to become to be worthy of a life that you've created. And, um, so, you know, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, subconsciously she knew what, what to do already. Cause I had been living it, both Kelly and I had been living in front of her. So she instantly started reading books. Like she bought Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People. And we did the seven habits together and I've uh, been through the compound effect. And right now we're in a course, uh, with Darren Hardy called the hero's journey. And Darren had actually asked me the question. He said, hey, would you mind coming on and me asking you some questions about your parenting style? And, and, and as it turns out, I said, you know, that, that would be good. But even better, why don't you ask my daughter? And dude, I mean, I was so proud of her. Like her getting on in front of like 5,000, 6,000 people online and talking about this, 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 this journey she's gone through where she's now 
come to a point in her life where she feels, I need this in my life to be better. And quite frankly, it was her idea that we do the hero's journey. And since then, my wife has joined and my son's joined. So we're doing it as a family. And today, actually, we had a session. And afterwards, you know, the texting back and forth of the family, it was it was awesome. So the engagement is high. Super proud. Dude, how cool is that going, you know, full circle from, you know, doing everything you can when you're starting off, feeling like sometimes you're not as there as often, trying to set the example, and then full, you know, in, in their early 20s for them to come back and ask you, I know they both ask you to mentor them, you know, and have them participate in this hero's journey and be able to share that. I, that would be a dream. And um, I think for a lot of people listening, it's something to aspire to. Um, you know, one thing I want to get back on the business stuff, Brad, because, you know, you are one of those people when I have big challenges, like sea level strategic uh, issues that I give you a call and I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do that. And you've always got this sage advice. I mean, and I know it's it's from real real experience. There's a lot of people on the internet giving around advice and they haven't been through it, right? What, you know, as as you even with Pila, the your new company that you're the co-founder of, you know, being I think it was top 10 fastest growing companies in Canada, an incredible growth ride. Um, I feel really lucky to be an investor and, and part of that to a very small degree on the board. Um, what have you learned about the people side of the business? Like, you know, people mm. want to talk marketing tactics, growth hacks, et cetera, but let's right. talk people. Cause right. I think you and I both resonate that that's where the investments got to be made. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really the school of hard knocks. I got lots of battle scars on this front, but fortunately there's been some wisdom from my wounds. Um, you know, first of all, the business of business is people right? We are in the people business, whatever you're doing. I've heard people say, I'm in the SaaS business. I'm in, you know, the consumer products business. I'm in the food business. No, you're in the people business. We all are in the people business. And let's get clear on that because without people, there is no business. And then behind that, it's how do you get the right people to help fulfill your vision and mission for a company? How do you then unleash their potential and empower them to, to live up to the, their potential and quite frankly, the potential that the company needs? You know, there's, there's three things that are constantly breaking when you're building a business and we've identified them as your capital, your processes and your people. They continually need to be reinvented. You know, growing a business actually is stressing a, a business. Like when you grow it, we all want to grow, but you create stress, right? And so the, the, I, the repercussions of choosing to grow a company, especially a fast growth company like we've built is that we are constantly reinventing those those areas. And so- And again, capital, people, and process. Correct. Yeah, those are the three. And they're the vital three. And you gotta be continually like, you know, we just finished a fundraise, as you know, not that long ago. And I'm in the middle of fundraising and we don't need it yet. Why? Because I know we're going to need it at some point in the future. It's a part of just any growth company, you're burning capital. Um, we are in the process of hiring continually. Why? Because we know, even though for today, if I look at today, I have the right staff. I may even have too many staff. I know that in six months, we're not going to have the right people in place to fulfill the vision at the time. And our processes are a continual work in process because we're constantly breaking them. There's, there's constantly going to be breakage across an organization because what worked from getting you from zero to one won't be the same thing that gets you from one to 10. So you got to continually upgrade and improve that. And I mean, you're the king of processes. You've got uh, a lot of SOPs for everything. So, uh, but on the people side, you know, the first and most important thing is, you know, the CEO of this company and Matt, my, my co-founder, he's a brilliant CEO. He sets the cadence. You know, he's the person who really sets the, the vision, the mission, and then the values of the company in terms of what it is that we want to accomplish long-term, how we're going to get there, and who are, how are we going to behave in terms of the way that we show up and interact. And then his job, better than anyone, including myself, is to model those out every single day. I, as a co-founder, have to follow suit, and I have to be involved in that as well. And then we're collectively involved in going out and finding the people who uphold those values. And, you know, your values are what you hire and what you fire by. They're the most important part. They're the constitution. It's like the rules of engagement for how we do life together uh, as people. And, um, you know, if you get the right people and you get the right talent density, anything's possible. You know, I would put a, uh, an average idea with the right people over the best idea in an average team all day long. And the one thing that uh, I'm extremely, um, I guess, vigilant about is just our process in terms of do we have the right people? 
are they in the right seats and are they empowered to do the right things that will help us fulfill the vision mission for the company? Now, one thing you've shared with me is that the fallacy sometimes we get into is that we believe in the person more than they believe in themselves. Mm. Un unpack that because it's burned me a couple times. <laughs> Well, if you're an entrepreneur, I think every entrepreneur has had this happen. And I'd even say for myself, it's probably not the first or the last time it's going to happen to me either. Um, well, it's definitely not the first, but it won't be the last. You know, entrepreneurs are optimists by heart, right? We see potential everywhere, including in people who don't see it for themselves. And the problem is you can't give what you don't have. Like if that person hasn't identified that they have their potential, even though you see those seeds of greatness inside them, I don't care what kind of coaching, what kind of program you put them through, the odds of them actually rising to that potential are very low. They have to see it in themselves first. Yes, and there is a difference between, you know, going from, um, like I've had examples in my company where I hired somebody who showed the potential but didn't necessarily show their full potential. And then we've been able to pull the full out, right? but I've never had the options where someone had potential, but didn't, you know, you saw it, but they weren't exhibiting in any way ever get to that. So, you know, we are constantly looking for people who have to show some semblance of potential in their life so that we can see, we can then uh, cultivate the full potential out of what's possible through empowerment, through personal development, through getting them surrounded by like-minded people. Right. And that's the one thing I would say I'm the most proud of. I think the talent density in this building is incredible. Like we have done, an extraordinary job of people putting people through a gauntlet that we're very proud of that flushes out as many decoys as we can, <laughs> right? Because the only thing worse than having the right people in is having the wrong people in your company that potentially could be sabotaging the culture. Hurtful. Right? And, and what do you think is different about your leadership style that first time entrepreneurs or people that still haven't scaled past that 10 million level? What, what do you do different in your interactions or your communication style? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this, about the ceiling of complexity, mm. right? That, um, and it was Dan Sullivan who I first heard this from, and I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. He said, you know, I've got, and as I know you do, a lot of grit. I can go longer and harder than most. In fact, I used to pride myself that that was a big part of how I built my first companies is that I just would just put it all out put there in, and leave yeah. nothing behind, right? Um, and Dan Sullivan recognizes that a bunch of entrepreneurs have that. And he says, and what happens is they set a two times goal. And because they know that within their own efforts, they can do two times. It means they have to work 80 hours a week. That means they have, you know, don't take vacations. They can get it done. He said, what you need to do is set a 10 times goal. Because he know that you will realize if you set a 10 times goal, there is no way within your own capacity that you can actually do that. You will have to learn to leverage others. And I would say for me, one of the hardest things for me to learn over the years, and it's something I'm still learning, is how to let go how to let go and to delegate, not abdicate, but delegate properly, give people clear instructions in terms of the outcomes that they need, and then trust them to be able to deliver on those outcomes. And, um, you know, my journey, particularly even more so, like I would say in 2012 is when I had this first aha in terms of like, I need to get better people. Cause I was sitting around my, my <laughs> boardroom table and I was the smartest person in the room and that's not good. <laughs> and, I can honestly say that when I left the toy business in 2017, as I sat around that, that boardroom table, I was not the smartest person in that room in marketing, sales, product development, manufacturing, any of those. But I was the smartest person in the room for recognizing to hire better people in me in those areas and empower them to do it. And as we've moved on to Pila, um, you know, we've even just refined the curation process even better so that really sitting around that table now, I feel like, okay, I'm sitting amongst people that are just brilliant at what they but do. But how do you, I mean, th this whole idea of like the, the, the delegating the outcome, like somebody comes to you with a problem, how do you, how do you not want to give them the answer? Like how, what is your process for that kind of communicate as a leader? Like how do you develop leaders? Cause at the side, you guys have grown like crazy and continue. And I'm just fascinated by how you've built your executive leadership team and the rhythms. How do you coach your leadership team to build leaders in the company? Yeah, so I think just about every entrepreneur is usually their own worst enemy because they feel empowerment by having the answers. They feel important. Mm. It's good when they have a lineup at their door and people that are coming to them to look for the direction. I'll tell you as you scale and as you get older, it starts to wear. 
So a simple principle that we've applied and is incredibly uh, productive in terms of problem solving is called 131. And basically the idea is you cannot come to a leader, not, nobody in the company, right down to the very you know base level of the company. Frontline workers. You can't yeah. go to your direct report with a problem unless you present it with one problem, three possible solutions, and your one recommendation after you spend some time thinking about it. And it has been the forcing function of getting everyone to feel empowered to think, to problem solve. Because everybody in the company has the capacity to grow sales, reduce costs, and mitigate risk in some level, right? So we want them, and that's typically what problem solving is, triaging those three things. And so we've given everybody that ability to do it. And um, I think after you implement that, I think you're going to find that within a very short period of time, you're going to flush out the people who really are there to, to do the work or those who are yes people, because some people really they feel empowered by empowering you to give them answers. They they leech off of you and then you will realize real quickly that they're not the right people for your organization. Because they're not adding management bandwidth. They're not adding capacity. 100%. It's exponential in terms of the outcome too. Like it's not, it's not linear. When people start doing this, your ability, particularly in a fast scaling company, becomes exponential to getting to your outcomes. You move, you can bend time with that principle. So much faster. So much faster. Um, You've mentioned this a few times, you know, doing life, you know, and we talk about this where you're like, there's some really great people here that I want to do life with that, that, you know, it's lifestyle design before business plan, life plan before business plan is kind of something I've heard you say. Obviously that is something that I almost feel like you had another opportunity with Pila and moving to Kelowna to create that. What did it look like before? What happened? Why is that such a priority today? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes we need interrupts in our life just to get aware of our shortcomings. Um, I was addicted to the idea that I needed to work a certain level, a certain number of hours, do a certain amount of travel. Actually, you know, being a super elite Air Canada member was a part of that. Yeah. It's identity. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, in 2017, when I was, uh, <laughs> abruptly, uh, uh, removed Released and, to the market. Yes, that's yes, what you say. It. That's yeah. right. Released to the marketplace. It was the forcing function of allowing me to get clear on, you know, sometimes in life it's hard to know what you want, but then get clear on what you don't want. And it's easier to figure out the things you want. And so going away from that experience, I sat back and says, what were the things that I was doing that I don't want anymore in my life? And I landed on three, three principles to this day I live by. The first was life plan before business plan. In my entire life, I may have paid lip service to it. I may have said, oh yeah, my family's my priority and you know, my faith's my priority and all this. But truly, look at your calendar. That tells the truth. Like where you're investing your time, that's where you really are um, as a person. The second was uh, only awesome people, uh, AKA life's too short to work with assholes. Um, and, un and unpack the release to the market because I think you're, personally, I think it's, I feel like you're hard on like the situation. Like, I mean, you had, you merged with another company. I don't know if you're comfortable disclosing some of that, but you know, that was just one of those wrong read of the person I'm assuming, right? Like what happened in that scenario that, that my, people can take some lessons from? Sure. Well, <clears throat> just to backtrack a little bit. So bankrupted the company in 2006, fought to try and fix it. Uh, by 2008, realized couldn't fix it bankrupted it again, finally, uh, took a sabbatical. Corporate bankrupt, not personal. So That's right. Understands. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Um, and similar to this situation went away and, you know, got clear on what were the things I didn't want anymore so I could create a new business model. Started a new company in 2009 called Tech for Kids. Uh, it, it went through, you know, the birthing process, like any startup, right? Lots of challenges and difficulty, but we were really fortunate. We were really lucky, right ideas at the right time. And that business scaled very quickly um, in a different capacity. Instead of being a distribution company, we're now a manufacturing company. Instead of being focused on Canada, we were global. We eliminated the warehouse from our model and did FOB only. So we had really a much more lean, efficient model and uh, it was working really, really well. Um, I had brought along the investors from the original company into this new company because I was, you know, personally you wanted to do right by them, <laughs> do right by them. And I was personally guaranteed as oh, well. Yeah. There's that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a few things that motivated me. 
um, you know, I, I talk about that. I didn't want to make money. I just want to get back to zero. It was like, you know, we were going through the valley of the shadow of death. But in any event, uh, you know, when you bring investors into your company, you've agreed to sell your company, right? At some point, they're looking for- They want exit. liquidity. They want liquidity. Yeah. And we had done a couple dances with different people uh, through kind of 2012, 2016, but nothing really formalized uh, that was meaningful. We, we, we got actually into due diligence with one company, but it, it was just not going to be a good culture fit. And then this opportunity came along for a merger with my company. And, <clears throat> you know, I've come to learn that the two most important decisions you're going to make in life is who do you marry and who do you get in business with? Because that requires a level of trust that is unique, right? I mean, you know, this is what I love about Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team is that he talks about at, if you have trust at a high level, then you're willing to get into conflict. You're willing to not conflict for the sake of conflict, but you're working for the best. You're willing to have you're hard conversations. You're fighting for the best outcome. A hundred percent. Even if it's uncomfortable. A hundred percent, even if it's uncomfortable. And, um, you know, this relationship, as we started to go down the path, initially on paper, it looked beautiful. Yeah. We were taking our company, which was doing about 60 million, their company, which was doing about 60 million. We're going to put them together. We acquire another company. business. Big, yeah. Economies of scale. And we did do the merger. Uh, we acquired a company along the way, had several in the pipeline to acquire. We generated about 130 million in revenue, had about 130 employees. So wow. it was about one-to-one -one ratio. And um, we were supposed to be co-leaders and yada, yada, yada. Um, it turns out that we had very different worldviews and philosophies for how to scale a company. And, um, and the problem is, I, it's on me. I knew early on that the cultural fit wasn't perfect. But I also had so much... Invested. Right. Emotionally, mentally, and quite frankly, I owed my wife <laughs> some liquidity, quite frankly, based on all the crap she had been through. So I was just kind of turning a blind eye to it. So when we merged the companies in the summer of 2017, within 90 days, I was uh, released to the marketplace. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, fortunately, it was a sudden exit, but I had a soft landing. Um that I was eventually bought out of my shares. Uh, that yeah, there's, I mean, some nuance in the contract that essentially they went through a process that triggered this liquidation where they had to buy your shares, right? Well, it, it, it's a little more complicated than that. I, I had actually um, gone to the market to sell my shares to private equity because we had been doing dances with private equity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without getting into all the boring details, uh, there was a threat that I could sell my shares to someone else and they didn't like the idea of me picking their partners for them. So for sure. they chose to buy me out and, um, you know, best thing that ever happened to me, quite frankly. 100%. So, um, so, and, you know, getting clear that, you know, pick your partners very carefully, particularly the people you're going to be doing a lot of life and with. That and that influenced this yeah. next stage. Yeah. And then the third principle that came out of that, so the first one was life plan for a business plan. The second was, you know, life's too short to work with assholes, you know, only awesome people. And the third was do things that make impact. So none of what I hate, less of what I tolerate, and everything that I love. Because I know when I'm in the zone, you know, like I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I don't know about you, but, you know, there's a big movement towards meditation and I do my own sort of practice around that. But I hear this constant emptying the mind. And I don't know about you, but trying to empty my mind is like, like wrestling a tiger. I mean, it's just, it's frenetic. But where I truly have harmony in my mind is when I'm in the flow state. Like when I'm working on stuff that's really blowing my hair back, not that I have much to go back <laughs> anymore, but things that are really important to me, I don't have to worry about my mind. It's really there. It's present. It's focused. It's intentional. And I'm moving important projects forward. And so I'm really a big believer in doing more of what you love gets you in the flow state where you truly can make impact and whatever it is you're, you're working on. And that's where I want to be. And that is the life plan before business plan, the move to Kelowna, the calendar, which I know, you know, looking at that week and trying to create those magical memories. Um, Brad, as we wrap up, I'm, you know, I'm curious and I ask all my guests this and you've mentioned it a few times, which I was like, oh man, he's going to answer this before we get to it. But who do you feel you had to become to achieve the level of success that you're honestly just starting to do? I mean, you're a young dude. We're going we're gonna to be creating <laughs> some really cool stuff over the next 30 years together. Um, you know, looking back at that 20-year-old to, to the person you are today, who, who, are, who did you need to become to, uh, to get to this level? 
You know, I'm going to start with humility because I think it's a part of our human condition that we tend to, um, you know, the, the original sin, if you will call it that, uh, Lucifer thought he could become God. And, you know, as the story goes, he's cast out. And, um, you know, Jim Collins, when he does his assessment of how the mighty fall, he talks about the five stages of decline. And the first is hubris, pride. Um, I was very proud uh, as a kid. I was proud of the fact that I could be the fastest kid, the toughest kid. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed into my business endeavors. And I was just rolling through all of that and thinking that I could basically just roll my way through situations. And uh, I'm really grateful for the dose of humility that I was given. And I'm constantly reminded that I am human and that I have my shortcomings and that I need to be constantly, again, grounded in gratitude. Reminder that, you know, I'm a speck on a speck floating in a galaxy that's a speck in the universe. Like, take that all in perspective and realize it's not that meaningful. But the flip side of that is, according to everything we know, you're the only version of you in that entire universe. So while you're infinitely small, you're also infinitely incredibly important because you're the only version of you that's ever been found anywhere in the universe. So that zooming in and out and getting grounded about who I am is a part of my becoming because I have not arrived. It's an ongoing process. And I think in general, most people have it wrong. You know, we look at the media and the media tells us where, we're, where, where our shortcomings are, right? Like you look at an advertisement, it basically is a, a talking to you. You suck. Your worth. And you got to have this car or you got to do this or do that in order to have happiness, right? So most of society, it's that you have to have this thing to be happy or you got to do this thing to be happy. In the end, it turns out it's be, do, have. Who do you need to become that'll then get you to do the things that will give you the outcomes that quite frankly are a byproduct, right? Like having, as you know, we've had a lot of fun, a lot of adventures and those things are not that meaningful to me unless I'm with other people sharing them. Because on their own, they're not meaningful. But the media tells us, oh, you got to have it to be happy. You got to have that big house, that car, that, that, that's. Those should just be the trappings that help enrich the relationships in your life because that's what really counts. That's amazing, Brad. Um, I know you've got a book project that you're working on, and I know everybody's going to want to follow you, but you don't really do social media. But if somebody were to ask, where do I connect with Brad, what would be the best answer? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and again, this is no criticism to people who do social media, but I just found for myself with the ADD uh, mind um, and just the limited capacity that I needed to just shut off certain things in social media, you know, which I was on. So if you go on, you'll find my names out there. If you if you send me a message, I just don't respond because I don't check it. Um, you know, the the one exception would be LinkedIn. That's Perfect. the one area I go. So if you do have a message that you want to send, send it to me by LinkedIn. Otherwise, uh, I'm brad at pila.earth. Send me an email. I mean, your audience are cool people. Amazing so people. To- email Brad. If you have any questions you want to just say thank you, please email Brad. Brad, I'm crazy grateful for our friendship and looking to, uh, to do life even bigger. So I appreciate the time, man. Amen. Looking forward to it.